Hi guys, we're going to get started. Welcome, welcome to the meetup. Um, well, actually, it's the forum now. Even I still call it the meetup. <laughs> um, my name is Ina Abiodun. This is Mike Knowlton, and we're the co-founders of Story Code. And this is our monthly event where we bring together luminaries from the world of cross-platform media, entertainment, um, and tonight we have a publishing luminary. Um, so we're excited to have her here, and we're excited to have you guys as always. Thank you for coming. Um, we have some exciting stuff coming up in the coming months that we will be announcing soon, so stay tuned. If you're those people who like to get the, sp the seats early on Meetup, keep your eye peeled for the Meetup because you'll want to get some seats for the next few things we have coming up. But um, thanks again, and uh, I'll hand it over to Matt Bullish from the Film Society. Hey there, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Film Society of Lincoln Center, and thanks to Mike and Ina and to all of you for coming out. Uh, we just have a couple of general uh, announcements about our own convergence program here that deals with transmedia and immersive media. First of all, thanks to anyone who came. We had a really great, so we just launched a new video game centric or game centric program called Kill Screen Dialogues. It's led uh, by the editors of Kill Screen Magazine. Uh, you can check our website for upcoming dates. Uh, we usually sit down here with a couple of game designers and filmmakers and transmedia folks and talk about how all of those different worlds intersect. Sorry, it helps if I talk into the mic. Uh, next, uh, next Tuesday, we'll be hosting Andrea Phillips, uh, who is a writer, transmedia producer, author, the whole nine yards. Um, and she is launching this wonderful book, Transmedia for Creators. This will be a conversation here, um, down just right here. Uh, and it'll also uh, feature a book signing, and you can buy the book, and she'll be talking about the book. Book, 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 book. So, uh, for all of you guys who are members of Story Code, uh, you can actually go to our website, and uh, we've got this new system we're putting in place now. Sign up for our uh, general film link, uh, and it's filmlink.com, www.filmlink.com. Sign up for our, uh, our email list for our um, newsletter, and you'll receive $2 off, an email confirming it, $2 off, uh, for the, uh, the Andrea Phillips event next week. So that's two bucks off the regular ticket price, so it's incredibly cheap. It's like six bucks, I think, then, if you get that. So please uh, check it out. If you have any questions, please let us know. I've talked too long already. So uh, again, Convergence, check us out online. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Matt. Um, so a couple things. Um, if you're not following us on Twitter, please do, storycode.org, and um, hashtag, if you'd like to live tweet, is storycode. Um, so, uh, a couple months ago, I was checking out um, all things digital in the dive into media section, and I saw this really interesting video featuring Lisa Rutherford, and she was talking about the Caliloquy. Um, I emailed her, and she kindly responded and uh, agreed to come out and um, and to talk about it with us. And so. Uh, Really excited, so thank you for coming. Just to do a quick intro, um, Lisa Rutherford is the co-founder and CEO of Caliloquy. Caliloquy is a digital publisher of act active fiction. Um, their proprietary platform lets authors create episodic content, branching narratives, and interactive environments that deepen reader engagement. Uh, prior to co-founding Caliloquy, Lisa founded Elodie Partners. How did I do? Excellent. Um, and served as the president of virtual economy pi pioneer Two Fish, which was later acquired by Live Gamer, um, and as a venture capitalist with InQtel, Vista Ventures, and Palo Alto Venture Partners. Um, so Lisa's um, done quite a few things, and we're really excited to learn more about Caliloquy. So welcome. <laughs> My first technology challenge of the evening. And I failed. Okay, great. So thank you so much for having me. I'm all excited to be here. Um, 
I think the first place to start is really that, uh, as anybody who's paying attention to publishing knows, we've seen this huge rise of ebooks versus traditional publishing. Um, and everyone talks about the ebook revolution. But what they really mean by the ebook revolution in most cases is that they're focused on the hardware. They say, oh, this one lets you read in sunlight. This one has a glow screen so you can read while your husband sleeps next to you. And then there's this tablet that's really an iPad, but we're going to call it an e-reader so that you'll buy it anyway. Um, and uh, then they also talk about the hardware in terms of being something that helps you disintermediate, um, and meaning that they're saying, well, let's make it easier to distribute and also easier to give people access to books. Um, when I was a kid, I remember when the book van would come around, and it was like the greatest day um, every month in Pennsylvania because I would get access to all of these great books. But today you can read all of those books right here. Um, I can access them when I'm in New York, um, when I'm in California, and simply download them. It also gives, uh, makes it easier for content creators to then also distribute their content um, as we've seen through different types of publishing content. Um, then on the content side, in terms of what's being done with ebooks in the ebook revolution, is we see a lot of people saying, ooh, let's augment books. Let's add things to it. Um, and in some cases, that's let's add multimedia. Um, other cases, there's uh, let's add songs to it so you hear music playing while you read. Um, social, people are saying let's add the ability to talk about a book or write about a book when you're, when you're reading. And then also, particularly in the kids' space, animations and texts. What no one's been talking about, however, is the text itself. The book that you go and you buy in the library is essentially the exact same book that shows up here, regardless of whether you stick media on it or you add social features around it. What the content creator, in terms of the storyteller, is writing just simply hasn't changed. And that's what we founded Kaliloquy to help with. We publish what's called active fiction, um, it's also called interactive fiction, uh, but basically what it is is storytelling that is alive. Instead of publishing our books as a basic PDF file, we publish them as an active application. And what that means is that it allows our books to change, to grow. We can link content across series, um, and we can also embed engagement mechanics within the text itself. We're currently live on every e-reading platform. Um, we started off as a member of the Kindle Developer Program, um, and then recently moved on to all of the Android devices, all of the Apple devices, um, as well as obviously Nook. When I talk about engagement, the things I'm talking about are the ability to do really cool things with the text you couldn't do in a regular book. Um, if anyone remembers Choose Your Own Adventure from when you were a kid, um, this idea of branching narratives, well, we take that to a new level, which is basically saying a story, so if we have a young adult romance, you know that the hero and the heroine are going to end up together. Um, but how do they get there? How does their love story unfold? Um, and there might be two different pathways or different scenes. Um, so we give readers and writers the ability to spend more time with their characters in a much more fluid framework. Additionally, we can embed things like voting. Um, so you can ask your readers what they're interested in. Um, they can choose what happens, and then that affects the story later. Also, rereading loops that cause and spur the the readers to go back and say, oh, let me see that from a different character's perspective. Additionally, we have other books that work with um, unlocking and changing content. And I really think of the unlocking as being something we've borrowed from the gaming industry, which is rewarding readers for doing things that you want them to do. So if they read all of the pathways, they then get an extra bonus scene at the end. Um, or if they are trying to solve a mystery and they make all the right decisions, they're going to get a better clue, whereas someone who doesn't take all the right decisions might not have quite as good of an idea of what's going on inside the world. Um, additionally, changing content, we can do things like make text disappear on the e-reader. It could appear. Um, we have another author who's playing with Alzheimer's right now, where you're reading the book and there's this, um, from, the, from the perspective of the father, and he's talking to his daughter, um, and he's like, no, this is, I remember this is what happened. And she says, no, dad, that's not what happened. And you as the reader think, no, he's right, he's actually right. I thought this book was about Alzheimer's. It, clearly, he's the sane one. Um, but when you page back and you reread the section, it's actually been changed so that it reflects her memory and not his memory and not your memory. So we're really thinking about how the digital form doesn't just allow us to stick things on top of the book, but to really play with that narrative itself. We can also do something we call personalization. Um, which is basically the ability to take a best fit of a novel um, for each reader itself. 
These are shots, yeah, right, it's erotica. These are shots of our, our first uh, personalized erotica series, Great Escapes. Um, and when you come in, you can choose, A, the level of your erotica, so how steamy it is. You can also choose what your hero looks like um, and how they interact, and that's expanding throughout the series. But it's really cool for something like erotica where there are very diverse tastes within a single genre. It's very difficult for an author to write a story that appeals to everyone. This gives an author the ability to do some customization, and our technology on the back end then puts together that best fit story to try to give everybody the, the best experience possible. Um, because we're delivering them as active applications, the really cool thing that I think on top of it is we collect an enormous amount of data about what the readers are doing. Um, so I can tell you what choices they make, um, what's the most popular pathway, what character scenes do they read over and over again, where do they stop reading? Um, you know, you're losing interest on page 25. Uh, they were, you had a real page turner until chapter 10 and then they slow down. So it's really thinking about very in-depth in-book analytics as well to say, look, if people are engaging with a book more than just reading or more than just flipping pages, um, we as content creators can go back and say, okay, well, let's, um, let's take the feedback that we get from those readers um, and really listen to it. One really good example of that is um, a book series called Getting Dumped. Um, and so these are some of the real statistics from, from the first book. So Getting Dumped Part 1 um, has this one choice point in it where JJ, the heroine, is very scared and she needs to call someone to comfort her. And does she call Colin, Daniel, or Pete? Um, so there's a couple things that are really interesting. One was the loyalty of readers. 31% of our readers go back and read the same guy's scene multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you know, when we looked at how many read all three, in the first three reads, 18% of our readers want to read everything. They're like, I'm going to read Colin, I'm going to read Pete, I'm going to read Daniel. Okay. Um, but then they go back and they read their favorite. Um, and then some of the others, though, then go back and choose again and again and again. And my favorite people are actually the bottom line here, the 4.4% who go back and make at least seven choices. Um, we have one person who's chosen 32 times. Um, you go, girl. So, uh, <laughs> um, and so it's interesting to see that. But, but for Tana, for the author, what was really interesting about this was really this bottom graph here. When we were working on the, the novel, everybody involved in it, so traditional editors, copy editors, agents, myself, all of us were split pretty evenly around Colin or Pete. I love Pete. <laughs> Just put that out there. Um, and we were like, everybody's going to choose Colin or Pete, Colin or Pete, Colin or Pete. And uh, Daniel was originally supposed to die in the second half of the book. Um, but as the data started coming in, as you'll see, Daniel was far more popular than any of us thought. We hated Daniel. Um, and if we were a traditional publishing industry, we would have just been like, whatever. We all, of course we know what we're talking about. Um, and also, even when you looked on Twitter or on the discussion boards, even then, the greasy greasy, the squeaky wheels, were all still Colin and Pete. There was this hidden subsection of readers who were choosing Daniel, and maybe were ashamed to admit it, I don't know, because they weren't speaking up in the forums. Um, but because we had the data, and because we could see the actual statistics on what people were reading, um, when Tana approached the second half of the book, she was like, you know what? Maybe he's not such a bad guy. Um, let's keep him around. So uh, I'll give you a little spoiler alert. He goes to prison, and I'm guessing he's going to come back at some point future in the series, a reformed, very buff, very eligible man. Um, so then on Great Escapes, so the, uh, the uh, yes, oh yes. This is to make sure you're paying attention to my slides. Um, but yeah, so for The Great Escapes, our erotica series, 64% of our readers choose to do a full customization. That's an enormous amount. Um, they go through seven steps to get exactly what they want. Interesting factoids for all of you out there, 12% of women like a very hairy chest. 47% um, slightly hairy, so just so you know, guys, you don't need to wax. The majority of women are cool with that. Um, in terms of what they look like, black hair and green eyes, wildly popular compared to everything else. And the poor innocent picture there, that's me and my husband. A red hair and blue eyes and hazel eyes and blonde hair do not do well. So we're really glad we found each other since apparently no one thinks we're attractive. 
Um, and then also, you know, just in terms of sexiness, uh, yeah, there's a point you choose whether you're going to have an anal scene. Um, 67% of women, 67%. So yeah, so all the things you hear about Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, it's, again, they're numbers. And so on the one hand, it's, you know, it's an interesting factoid to get you to pay attention to me when I give a presentation. <laughs> Shameless. But on the other hand, it's also, it's super interesting feedback. So in terms of thinking, you know, so my husband is only 6%, but... But the truth is that in the publishing industry, the number of red-haired heroes is so low. So there actually is a small market for that. Um, and so the ability to give someone like me the ability to imagine my husband in a book is actually something that um, different consumers are willing to pay for and actually do want. Now, I was asked to do case studies, so I thought I'd talk you through how we how things work at Caliloquy, because it is a little atypical in some ways. Um, we start off, obviously, with acquisition, just like anyone else does. And I think most editorial process, it's really about, oh, this story. For us, we want, we're looking for a great story. We're looking for great writing. We're also looking for an author who fits us and a story that fits us. Um, and that is probably the hardest part of my job right now. So we're a startup. We've bootstrapped. And I'll get manuscripts that are truly stunning. There's one I'm thinking of in particular. I read it, and I was like, oh, I love him. Um, my editors read it. We love this book. But then we were like, it should be a book. At the end of the day, it needed to be a novel. And I'm not the best publisher for a novel because I don't do print. I'm looking at things that are very cutting edge um, and that we can do in an ebook format. So letting go of things that aren't right for us has been probably the hardest thing for me. When we find things, though, that we get excited are books and authors where, um, where I tell them, you know, take away the constraints and, and really just open your mind and, and tell the story. What kind of story do you want to tell? And what kind of story do you want to tell that you can't tell in a book? Um, and when we start asking those questions, the authors we end up working with are the ones who are like, oh, my God, I have this amazing idea, but you probably can't do it. And then we're like, tell us, tell us, and then we make it happen. Um, but it is, it's a very rare fit. So it's a very much a relationship because much more than with other publishers, you know, there's really a lot of collaboration. Um, and so one of the, I think, as transmedia and other forms of digital media move forward in the next few years, I think that there's going to be, um, it's going to be really difficult, particularly difficult for certain types of um, I'll call them auteurs, so people who are, it's my story and it's mine and you're very, very protective of that. That's going to be more and more difficult in the coming years, being able to be a team player and being able to, to work with a, a team who are trying to produce around you is actually incredibly important. Um, and it's one of the things that we, we, we look for immediately and early on. We try to meet every author um, that we're thinking about signing um, and really work through and talk with them. The next step of the process is this, so narrative mapping. If you're going to do something that has multiple pathways or has unlock codes or anything like that, you can't just sit down and start writing it or you're going to end up calling me in two days crying. That has happened. Um, instead, what we do is we go through a very, um, it's fun, we do a big whiteboarding process. Basically, we do a narrative map for every book and every series that we do. So the authors sit down with us and we hang out. This is actually the narrative map for Witches Brew by Heidi Kling. Um, I'm going to risk because um, then when she sits down to write, it's much more about, okay, instead of, oh, I'm writing this scene, does it work here, does it work there, to say, I'm going to write this pathway, and then I'm going to write that pathway, and to already know that they're going to resolve, because if you're worried about the resolutions early on, you're never going to get them resolved. You're going to be freaked out about it the whole time. I know because I wrote our first, our first test books and things like that, um, I, I did all the writing on the early ones, and it was, it was really incredibly difficult to do. Um, as a writer, let alone with the technology backing you. So we try to give our authors a ton of extra support in that upfront to really help them work through it. Um, then we kind of dive into the, the normal framework. So on the editorial side, we hire um, great developmental editors. We've gone after um, stay-at-home moms, so we look for moms who s stepped out of the industry. So we look at the big publishers, and we look for editors who were 
who were great um, and just decided to spend time with their kids. And we basically tell them, I have a 16-month-old too, so let's talk during, you know, feeding times and at 10 o'clock at night and, you know, whenever you want to get your work done. Again, as a startup, we have this freedom to really say, let's work outside the bounds. And it's been great because we've been able to get amazing, amazing talent to work on something that would be far riskier than they normally would be able to um, by being able to provide them with flexibility and support um, so they can stay on the cutting edge, they can still keep their skills alive. Um, it's a really nice fix for everybody. So I really encourage people, if you're ever thinking about, um, you know, thinking about needing part-time work or in a flexible work environment, um, you know, moms who've taken some time off are just one of the most amazing resources we've ever run into. Um, so then we go through the copy editing. At the same time, on the technical side, we have our entire back-end system, and we input the text. I think that those two little letters at the bottom of that screen, QA, is the absolute bane of my existence. Um, so I've been in the game industry, I've been QAing for years, I've been a writer, so I've been editing for years. When you mash those two things together, disaster breaks loose. Um, because you're looking, we're not just looking, do the page turns work, but do the page, uh, do the line breaks work, and is the spacing right? Or I remember the day we were like, oh, it's using smart quotation marks here and not there, and it was, it was just this entire mashup of disaster. Um, and that is something that we are still working on streamlining and getting really good at. Because right now it's just all hands on deck. We all basically eat jelly beans and cry for a couple days for each book. Um, and then we push it out. And it's also, again, a monster because we're, um, we're pushing out to all these different platforms. So the Fire, Nook, and Android all use the same code base but they are all different stores. So we have to go to the different stores, we have to do the Apple version, we're also, the Amazon Kindle, the e-ink screens are completely different code base as well. So in terms of getting the books in and tested and then pushed out, um, that is also something that we've just, it's been very challenging because in terms of picking a launch date, um, like we submitted a book, King Solomon's Wives, last week. It's live on two platforms right now, but I don't want to publicize it until it's live on all the platforms. Um, at the same time, we have people writing us and being like, there's a new book. Yes, there is a new book. Why hasn't it launched? Because we don't want it to yet. So we're definitely trying to figure out the different ways. And, and obviously, um, our partners aren't always set up for every little thing that we need. Um, to that end, it's I'm not all roses and sunshine. Um, I love what I do. And I love what we're doing. And our authors are amazing. But there are things that are very frustrating. And so this, you know, the question, are we a book? Kindle is incredibly supportive of what we do. They've been so amazing to us. But something like this, they're a huge company. Getting them to change something that is very core to our little business, it's actually very small for them, but it affects their entire store because they have to QA it. So um, it, you know, it is one of the challenges, and I think as um, other forms of companies and other uh, transmedia moves forward and pushes against those walls, it's something that's going to be more and more of an issue. Um, some trends, some things that I think are cool that are coming up. So one, we're starting to see storytellers emerge. And what I mean by that is we're starting to get pitches from people who aren't saying, I'm an author. We're actually getting pitches from people that say, I tell stories. And it just warms my heart because that's really where this all started. Wayne and I, um, Wayne's my co-founder, we had both sold our prior companies and we were sitting around my dining room table at night and we were just bullshitting. We were just telling each other stories and we realized there's that interplay, how you respond to each other. Um, and the ability to change a story or add in. And, and as we started talking about it, we're like, there's something that is, it's not that there's something wrong with a book, because a book is a wonderful, beautiful thing. But there are other types of storytelling that haven't been able to expand to that mass level yet. Um, and this is a device that might be able to do that. When these price points go down to $15 or $19 for kids, um, you know, what can we start delivering that'll be our version of the, the next wave of content. Um, I don't know that we're going to have our generation's Canterbury Tales, but someone will. 
someone is going to come up with a new art form um, that really changes the way we think about stories and how and how we consume them and how we publish them. So we're excited about that. I also think this line of fan and pro-fiction is, is collapsing. Um, obviously we've seen it and we're very aware of it in the erotica space um, as well as you've seen it in a lot of the movie industries, but the, as collaboration around stories changes, copyright protection, um, who owns what, characters, ideas, uh, what kind of forum protection do you have in terms of service? It's all really interesting. But what I love about it is that you're starting to get this, um, this mass input and people really creating together um, and starting to use tools in a way that we haven't seen before. So we're excited about that. I also put integrated transmedia. Um, what I mean by that is at the beginning, I, I, I'm very, I hate it when people just tack multimedia onto a book but I love it when it works. I love it when it's integrated. We're, um, we're looking at a couple projects this year. So we've, uh, our platform supports full support for video, audio, different types of multimedia, and we just haven't had a reason to turn it on yet, but we're getting ready to because we're starting to see people who are coming in with, um, with stories where it's the, the video is truly integrated into that storytelling process in a very different way. Um, and I'm so excited about it because it's really magical. Um, we're also seeing resurgence in contemporary. I think that's something that's really important for um, people who are thinking about storytelling, that uh, it's been paranormal, paranormal in the publishing industry for a few years now. Um, I think we're going to revert back to contemporary. And there's a lot of really great opportunities there because contemporary is a lot cheaper to produce when you're looking at video as well. So that ability to integrate things that are very current, um, I think is actually, I think it's just a really nice trend for people who are thinking about the different media forms. Also crowdfunding and other types of new business models. We're playing around with branding um, and different brand support for different things, sponsorships for books, um, crowdfunding, Kickstarter. Like, it's amazing. Like, there's all these new and exciting ways. And, and what I love about that is that while distribution is still controlled by large companies, we're no longer seeing the control over the resources to create being in their hands as well. And that's starting to be dispersed as well. And I think it's a wonderful trend that we'll start to see. Um, so my, my takeaway is the, the ebook revolution has really been about devices. I want it to be about the words and I want it to be about the stories. Um, and I think that that's all anyone who loves content really wants at the end of the day. Um, but if I could leave that with you and uh, if you've got a story, write me. I love to hear them. So thank you. Thanks. Um, so, uh, do we have any questions for Lisa? I know you're shocked. I have a question. <laughs> uh, two very quick questions. I can take them. Okay. First one is you were talking about the barriers to traditional publishing coming down. How has that affected your submissions process? your safeguards there, you know, do you still have to do a whole agent to submission, blah, blah, blah. Second question is talking about linking within series. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of us in this room are fantasy fans mm -hmm. and that, you know, wait, somebody picked up a half moon shaped cookie in book one. How do you handle that going back to find it without destroying the foreshadowing art of stories like that? Submission yeah. protections. 
Yeah, so I would love to take submission from anybody, but we are small. So we currently only work with authors who have agents or mm -hmm. have been published in some other format. And it's simply for a, a, a uh, for purposes of our, our, uh, our resources. What I will say is anytime I speak somewhere, I always say that goes out the window. So if you don't have an agent, you haven't been published, write me and say that you met me here. Um, and we accept from anybody whenever we meet people in person just because it's, uh, again, we can't do it for everybody, but we can do it for small segments of people that we meet. Thank you. Sure. Lisa, um, about the data, I mean, that's some amazing insights into readers. Um, are there any plans to monetize that or build like business models around the data that you're collecting in the future? One is um, for authors to get that feedback in terms of having a manuscript or understanding, you know, where do people stop reading? Um, if you want to learn how people are reading your book, we can do a bunch of tagging and things like that. So we've been thinking about different ways to open up the platform um, where, it would, where it would be that we were publishing segments of work so that people could submit and then past readers could kind of read through. So we've been looking at some different things with that. Um, other than that, you know, we obviously we could license Um, this is a bit of a behemoth area, but um, I, I know it looks like you deal mostly with entertainment um, text. Uh, how have you guys have you guys thought much about how education fits into this? Um, I'm not talking about you know the the previous thing that everyone had in their mind as far as you know you. You just have a video pop up for Ulysses S. Grant, uh, you know, from the History Channel or whatever. So, well, there's a couple things. So, one, we're, we're branching out into nonfiction this year, which I'm really excited about. I was a philosophy major, um, so I love the idea of the Socratic method being actually implemented in a, in a philosophy text. Um, it's something we've thought a lot about. Also, for, for kids um, and teenagers, so When we started, it was very much a decision to start with Kindle and with the e ink displays because we wanted our focus to remain where it was, which was on the narrative. And if we start off if you immediately, if people, oh, you have to have pictures, oh, you have to have this, you have to have that. Um, and so it wasn't. But I, I come from a line of corporate parents and teachers, and I love, um, I love the way that you can make narrative change. So it's something we're very interested in, but it hasn't been on our roadmap. Um, next step is nonfiction. Um, following up on the data question, have you or do you think you could sort of, it seems like a weird concept with books, but optimize a book based on feedback that you're getting from the data as well as feedback? Is that okay? So, boo. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Would you optimize the, op have you like thought about changing the options that are out there? Not just like releasing a best of, but changing the options that are made available to an author. Yes. Based on what they're demonstrating. Yeah, we could do that. I will say the, we're also very careful. We don't ever want it to be that, it's not, we don't ever want it to be. I think there's a place for um, you know, kind of crowdsourced content, but that's not what we're trying to do, meaning we still want the authors, the authors retain control over everything that's written. They can ignore the data if they want, um, but we do give our authors weekly, we give them their data on a weekly basis, so every once a week they go and they look through it, 
um, and we can live update the app at any time. So if she was like, hey, you know what, I want to throw in a fourth guy next week, we could do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more? Sure. <laughs> He's distracted. Okay. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> um, did, do authors come to you with the idea of how they want it to see it be interactive, or you just look for works that you think originally, have potential? Yeah, so originally it was us going out and hunting, um, hunting authors and hunting manuscripts and then working with them to retrofit. We also, um, so Kira Snyder is, um, we bought her book on a, it was a paragraph, and it was, she's, a, she's a screenwriter in Hollywood, um, and she'd never written prose before, but she gave us this pitch for this amazing series, and it's turned into Parish Mail that we just fell in love with. So, but from the beginning with Parish Mail, she knew it was going to be structured like a TV series um, and have overarching narratives and mini narratives for each of the episodes. So it totally depends. Now we're seeing many, many more people coming to us with, um, with the interactivity sketched out in advance. Um, but we do still see some people who submit something. They're like, I have this book. It's not quite right. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure this out or that. So we also, and we also get things that are books that people love, but they're like, I can't figure out how to shelve it. I love that. If anyone ever tells you they don't know how to shelve your book, send it to me. Uh, it's not an issue for us because we're looking online. Um, I don't need to know whether it's romance or thriller. I can find the people who will read that book and funnel them to it because we're only on the digital format. Um, so you, you guys I'm are... I'm trying to read your t-shirt. Uh, it's Carol Shelby. Oh, nice. Um, uh, so you guys are a publishing house mm -hmm. with a software platform. Have you... Um, would you talk a little bit about your decisions to be, be a content company as opposed to, say, a platform as a service? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So my last company was a platform, and Wayne's last company was a platform. So I think we both have been, we both understand the power of technology platforms, but the, it's not as much fun, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, that's, it's really not. And we knew when we, when we were figuring out, you know, one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is you get to decide how you spend your days. And we knew we wanted to do something where we really were touching consumers, um, yet at the same time leveraging our expertise. So we have an enormous amount of expertise in how to engage consumers, um, how to use social media to promote things, um, and then we also have technical expertise. So for us it was, let's take these things that we're very good at and then also something that we love. Um, and if, so if we were just simply providing a technology platform, um, it, it, wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be as much fun. And I'm sure that that would get dissected in any business press, but at the end of the day, you know, there's, a, there's something to be said for really enjoying what you do. So for us, it was saying we felt we were very uniquely qualified to provide not just the technology, but also the support for the authors. Um, it's, not, it's not lost on our authors that I, I was an English and philosophy major and I did sports writing and ghost writing. Like, I understand them better than most people who come from a technology platform would. Um, and similarly, if we just handed our technology to people in the publishing industry, you know, they might miss some of the things. So it was really, we, we just, it felt like the right marriage. Um, but it, yes, we could have done it a different way. Um, we'll see, we'll see if it was the right move. Did that answer your question? I, I, I my question was more about business and, and income and, and uh, generating revenue. Well, yeah, so in terms of the business you know, side of things, we, so we do, we, uh, our revenue model is selling books um, as opposed to licensing the platform. Um, and that is, again, that, that was very much a business decision that there is, uh, there is faster revenue and proof of concept of the viability of the platform than if we, if we were just selling this concept to publishers, it would still be a year, two years to see the books come out. Um, and so a year, two years for licensing revenue because we wanted to bootstrap and we knew that we didn't want to take venture funding early. We knew we wanted to prove it out in advance. For us, it was a very easy decision um, to say that this is a way to get revenue quickly um, and also at the same time flesh out the, the details of the platform itself. Okay. You should just interrupt me, by the way, if I'm not answering the right question. Just uh, say that's not what I meant. 
Okay. <laughs> Can you just talk very quickly about just like timeline, like how when you guys launched and, and like what your throughput is right now, like how many mm -hmm. uh, books you published, so and what you're looking to do, like in the near year or so. Yeah, so we um, we were accepted into the Kindle Developer Program um, last January, and we signed our first authors last summer. We published our first books in January, um, and so we have six books out now. We have two that are coming out this week, um, and then two more basically every month for a while. We have three huge launches coming in September. Um, they are true cross-media books, so in addition to the multi-reader platforms. They also have enormous social media and web components in terms of um, allowing the readers to interact with the authors in some really new and cool ways. So the plan was that we were like, oh, well, we'll add you know, two new series every quarter. Um, and that's what we've been doing in terms of signing. We now have 17 authors. Um, I will say I think we're going to slow down a little bit for a couple quarters just because I've been... Uh, We've been starting to look at our production timeline, and we're we're feeling a little overwhelmed right now. <laughs> it's good overwhelmed, but it is uh, there are days when we're like, "What are we gonna do?" So, uh, this question is about your market. Is it basically it's women and women authors? Oh, what a great question! I skipped over that too. The um, yeah. So when we started, we were originally thinking about uh, we tested a whole bunch of different types of books and genres. Um, and quite simply, women responded through the roof to these types of mechanics. Um, so while I am female, it was not because I'm a female um, that we decided to go after these markets. It was very much a business decision. Um, huge percentage of books sold on e-readers are young adult romance and romance. And that market also responds very well to engagement mechanics, as we've seen from our data and our response as well. So we felt like, well... Um, also, a lot of other people, there are other people who've been playing with some of the same ideas as us. They're all focused on fantasy. They're all men and they're all doing fantasy, um, which I think is the quote unquote natural fit, but it's actually not in reality the natural fit. Women want to explore and they want to understand characters and they want to, to share and, and engage in very different ways. And, and so we felt like we had a little secret sauce in terms of our market attack that's proven out to be very correct for us. Um, we do plan, though, to expand to other areas. We have, uh, we have, we're moving into thrillers. Um, I'm desperate for a great legal thriller. Uh, we can do some really, really cool stuff with discovery and evidence. So we are starting to look at different areas as well. So how do readers find the books on these websites when they're, like, they can be hidden or tricky to find and there are so many like, other books out there? Yeah, so our best methods of, so discovery is a huge problem for any ebook company. We're lucky we get a lot of promotion from our partners because we are pushing the envelope um, in terms of the technology use. So there's promotion on the sites, promotion through email pushes. Um, we also rely heavily on um, reviews and bloggers. And so links to the sites, links to where to buy the books. Um, or if you search for Caliloquy or you search for the titles, you obviously do find the books themselves. It's just if you were, but we are hurt by the fact that if you say, I, if you go, I love YA, let me see what the top sellers are in the books category, you're not going to see our books. We're looking for ways around that, such as finding ways to post excerpts. Um, we're trying out with one of our new books, we're doing um, a non-interactive version of the first episode to see how that raises sales or balances sales. So we are, and I'm, I'm personally very interested in that data and we'll probably publicize it on our blog just because it's something a lot of people are curious about and I don't think there's any harm in, in sharing things like that, so. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. He's not gonna let you talk. I can shut up. <laughs> it's possibly a rude question. Oh, he has a, his person. Oh. Hi. Um, just want to know if you can share some insight or any ideas that you you came across as uh, as having motion picture or film as a centerpiece and maybe the novel as secondary. Yeah, we actually um, oh, I, have, I have a book I love. Um, it's amazing, and uh, and that's really what it is. And when we first read it, it was October of last year, and we were only on the e-ink Kindles, and there was no way we could support the author and the book. Um, 
I did circle back to him, and unfortunately, he has signed with someone else, and I was, I was sad. I'm happy for him, but uh, now that we're on the devices that can support it. Um, so I think the things that are really powerful there are, are the question of the visualization versus the imagination is, I think, the biggest hurdle for reading audiences, meaning that we see readers, particularly female readers, are interested in their own image and their own you know, what, what do these characters look like, et cetera. And then they complain later when the movies come out and this guy's too short or that guy's too tall. Um, but when they're reading that book, there's something, pardon me? They pick the guy. Yeah, well, yeah, no, they pick the guy. But there's something very perverse about, um, it perverts the purity of the reading experience for a lot of people to have the visual first. Um, and so thus, one of the things we've talked about with people who wanted to do things around each other is I think there is, I would caution to do to start with story, um, and then have the movie embedded part way through in some way. Just give them that beginning part to be able to imagine for themselves. Because as a reader, that's the expectation. If you start with a movie and then you dive them into the text, um, they might still love it and enjoy it, but they've they've lost that one little thing for them. So part of the mashup magic is is figuring out what expectations you can break and what expectations need a little more time. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of? Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, my original question was about the, the size of audience and if you've seen any breakout successes, but I actually had a second question, which okay. is um, works that you find inspiring even if they preceded ebooks, or if there are some ebooks out there that you truly respect at this point, there's so many ebooks I respect, um, and there's so many books before that. I, I, it's such a question. Um, I mean, there's so many. I love the work that was being done before they were acquired by Facebook. Um, now I can't remember the name of the company. Pushpop. Yes, Pushpop. I love what Pushpop was doing. Um, really strong technology base and really doing um, really doing interesting work in terms of, of layering things on. I think that um, in the kids space, I love Duck Duck Moose. Um, I think they're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, the Ruckus guys, I think, were really ahead of their time in terms of being a, a publisher um, that maybe got started a little bit early. Um, I am, and then in terms of just regular ebooks, I, you know, there's there's not that many ebooks that are different than the regular books. So my other list is, you know, just books that I've read that I've loved. And there've been a lot of them, but in terms of the ebook version standing out to me over the print version, um, I haven't seen that many that I've been particularly engaged with. And it's something that I do hope I will see. And the first question Yeah, so we're not allowed to release our data from Amazon, but I will say that we've, we've done well. Um, people have been excited about it, and they've engaged tremendously. So it's not been, we haven't had the bestseller. Of course, when we opened up the floodgates the first day, we were like, maybe we'll have the top 10 in the Amazon store, and you hope, but it, you know, it doesn't usually happen, and it didn't. Um, so we're still looking for that, you know, the kind of kingmaker. Um, I think we're... But that's also, you know, as we move forward and people become more familiar with it, and as the ebook penetration increases, because it is still only a small percentage of the overall book market, print books still are very significant. I just wanted to ask you about the economics uh, for content creators. Mm -hmm. I know you can't say exactly, but just give me an idea. Is it are deals structured like traditional publishing? Or are they different? I will tell you exactly what they are. So. Um, <laughs> Yes, because this is mine. Um, so what we do, we felt it was really important to, if we were going to rethink the book, to also rethink the publishing structure. So with our authors, we do 50-50 rev share off top line revenue. Um, you'll see a lot of people who are like, oh, we do 50-50 rev share, but they take out all their costs first. That's not what we do. So if we sell something for $10, Amazon takes their 30% for distribution, and then we split it 350 and 350 to the author and to us. We also get paid um, by Amazon and Nook and all of our and Apple within 30 to 60 days. So we then turn checks to our authors within 30 days of that. So instead of waiting six months to a year, um, we feel if we're getting paid on a monthly basis, so should you. Um, it's very typical in the Valley to pay that way for app developers, so we felt it made sense to do that here as well. 
um, I write a lot of checks. <laughs> That's the only thing I didn't realize. I didn't think that through <laughs> while we're still small before we have a good payroll system. Um, and then, the, uh, then what we do is for other types of rights, so subsidiary rights such as audiobooks, um, print versions, um, we, and film rights, what we do is because we provide all of the data that we collect to those folks, we take a small percentage of the author's share of those, but the rights remain with the author and their agent. So the author and their agent, because the agent is the best person to go do those negotiations. Um, and so for us, it was about having the integrity to say, I'm never going, I'm not, I don't have time to master all of those skills, so let's leave the mastery with the people who are the good ones at it, um, but align all of our interests. And, and I have to be honest, to date, I've been incredibly happy with our structures. I feel like, um, I feel like we've been incredibly aligned with our authors, and, and they'll shift as the market moves, I'm sure, but, um, but for right now, we've felt really good about where we've landed. Uh, have you experimented any with like propagation strategies like inside the text, like either deeply embedded, um, like sharing, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, with a friend or connecting with somebody outside of the, of the work? The coolest piece of technology we've built is a multi-reader environment. It's so awesome. Um, and for the right type of books, we've been playing with it with different things and it's people love it. So as a book club, you can read a book together, a zombie apocalypse. And if you all make the right choices, you're going to live. But if one of you screws up, you're all going to die. Um, and it's amazing. It's so immersive and it's wonderful. It's not supported on most of the platforms yet, so we haven't done it. Um, we also haven't turned on sharing, but that was purely a business decision um, in that it doesn't seem to be in that big of demand. So as we have as we have uh, queued our development framework, you know, we just looked at data. People aren't doing that much sharing. Um, they're not doing that much uh, social sharing in terms of seeing it affect, um, affect book sales. And so for us, it wasn't something that we prioritized. We prioritized the other stuff. Yeah, um, since, music, since your platform is so flexible, what do mm -hmm. you see music coming in on it? I don't like the soundtrack things, I will say that. But I do like music that has a purpose. Um, and what I mean by that is that if there's, if there's a reason for the sound, I would love to put it into a book. Um, and so I have no qualms against that. But the, any, we haven't yet seen someone who's come to us with something that wasn't more than, um, it'll be really cool because I'm adding music. And then we're like, well, what does purpose does it serve the story? And they're like, but it'll be really cool because I'm adding music. So um, I can imagine things that would be cool, like if there was a band in the story, for instance, or if they were in a bar and you know something signals something, I think that'd be really cool, and I would like that. Um, and so that's what we're really looking at. So I think that music should overlay, and it, music, and it's funny because music and, um, and the written word to me have both hit this renaissance, um, and things have changed so dramatically for both industries in the last 10 years um, that it makes sense to start to think about that, but, um, you know, there's obviously going to be rights issues around that as well. We did, um, we have one cool, we've done stuff like with Glee as well, so with cover music and things like that, um, where the, it un you unlock rewards, so you unlock the ability to see, to hear different cover songs and things like that, and I think that's really cool too, um, to use it as a carrot for different types of audiences. Um, <coughs> me again. Um, it's you again. What, uh, how, how big is the software development team and mm -hmm. how automated is this process for authors? For the author, it's very automated because they send it to us in email. Um, and but then, there's not like a, a GUI where the they can go... And then the elves run around. Yeah, yeah. so right now our, our user interface is not great yet. Um, again, in terms of our development process, it was the thing we figured we'd do last. So right now the authors send it to us and then we make magic happen. And then we hand them something, and they go, oh my god, it's my book, and it's really exciting. Um, for us, it is, try to think how long it takes, like maybe a day of effort for one, for one person, um, you know, one man day. And then in terms of our development team, we have, uh, we have three full-time. Three full-time yeah. software developers. Mm -hmm. And where are they? Palo Alto in San Francisco. Actually, they're in San Francisco. I'm in Palo Alto, California. All right, uh, last question. 
Okay, awesome. Um, it sounds like you guys work with a lot of traditional authors, now storytellers, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but you said that you have a background in gaming, and I'm surprised that people from that world aren't engaging more and sort of turning to this more literary game format. It's so funny. That's actually how we started, because we, when we were, again, when we were in the process of figuring out what to do next, my big complaint was I was like, women don't want to poke the cow, and they don't want to farm in Farmville. It's just that that's all there is. Um, and what women really want is they, and men, men run the gaming industry for, for better or worse. They're just not making, they're not, they're not inside the heads of women. Um, I have three friends who all were given jobs as the head of women games at well-known social media companies. And all of their projects got canned last year due to budget cuts. First to come, last to come, first to go. Um, and so I think it's really a shame but so we started off originally saying, let's bring narrative into social gaming. Um, and then for us, but then it turned around to say, let's bring engagement into narrative when we really started seeing the rise of the ebook platform, one. Um, and then two, when we realized the, a lot of the social hooks that are inherent in social games don't work in a narrative framework. Some of them do, but some of the things that make social, that make games do very well on platforms like Facebook are things that really truly would upend the, the narrative framework. And so for us, it was the, finding the right medium for that type of storytelling. Um, that being said, it, it really does hurt me deep in my heart that you know, two years on, literally the same stuff is on Facebook. I, I really just wish someone would, would get their head out of their ass. Can we end on get their head out of their ass? Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you very much. Very informative and uh, some awesome information. So uh, we have a five by five today. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we you know encourage members of our community to um, kind of present in five minutes a project that they're working on, and it gives them an opportunity to ask for help or kind of ask folks in the community, um, you know, how to how to pitch in and help out. So um, I'd like to introduce Catherine Myers. Um, Catherine is uh, currently working in the t TV development at CBS, but she's also created a um, application called Story TBD, and so she's going to tell us about it. And uh, here we go. Hello. I have a little bit of a cold, so sorry if I can't hear myself. Um, so yes, I work in television, and I've also done this. Uh, it dovetails nicely. Um, with what Lisa was talking about. So this is all our information. Uh, you could all download Story TBD right now. We have our 1.0 in the iTunes store. Um, and we are essentially, these are just screenshots so you can get an idea. Or if you download on your phone right now, you'll be way ahead of <laughs> what I'm saying. So we are just a, an interactive video app. Uh, if I were legally allowed to say so, I would say we were a choose your own adventure. <laughs> but we have gotten in trouble for saying that, so it's not what we are. Um, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, uh, so here, I'll just show you. So uh, essentially, we are, I don't know how to go back, but yes. So um, you know, there's the home screen on the left, and you can start your video, and you choose which story to play uh, in the middle tab right here, and then you go, and it'll can we play? Yeah. So this is just an example of like one of the. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as some of you have heard, NASA recently announced that Pluto is no longer the ninth planet in the solar system. <laughs> we no longer have any responsibility for what Pluto does. Never forget. So that's, you know, you, go, you start your story, and then immediately it cuts right there, and then you get this screen that pops up. These two buttons pop up, and you can choose where to go next. You know, do you want it, uh, you know, they aren't particularly specific, but it's, you know, it's all comedy, and, you know, there's a lot of comedy in the choice, 
So you go from there. Um, and in doing so, you make about three, of, three or four of these choices throughout. The videos are about 30 seconds, choose, 30 seconds, choose, 30 seconds, choose. Um, and then you get to the end. And um, so yeah, in doing so, you're totally customizing the video. You know, you're totally making it all your own. And your choices, my choice will be different than yours. Yours will be different than your mom's and your friends. And, um, and that personalization uh, really is conducive to sharing and comparing, rating and ranking among your friends and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, then at the end, in the summary, it will let you know uh, within the stories uh, where you are, how far along, um, what progress you've made, so you know which will encourage you to go back and complete the rest of your choices. Um, and then once you pick that, then you can go and it will uh, aggregate all the stories that you've created, all the little videos, which are about a minute each, a minute or a minute and a half. So you can go back and watch them and see which ones you like. Um, and so for us, that's really it. It's incredibly simple. It's really made for dummies. And um, we're in the iTunes store, so we have our 1.0 app. Um, and now our big push, you know, we have more videos coming out. Like up here, we've talked to some really great people who have expressed a lot of interest in making them for us. It's outrageously easy. You know, there are so many people on the web that make fun videos. And so we're just saying, why not make them for us? Because it's a lot more fun. It's an incredibly engaging, interesting platform. Um, we're also on App Story, <laughs> like required by them to say that. So we're fundraising, you know, to really expand the platform. Um, and App Story has been wonderful, unbelievable place. Um, and this is really the vision, you know. So we're 1.0 in the App Store, and uh, down the line, we would like to expand the platform. Now it's really one, your video starts, and then you have two choices, two choices, two choices. Um, so one, two, four, eight, in that little pyramid of stories. But, you know, we, I mean, in my wildest fantasies, I would just love to go crazy and have a million, you know, always a binary choice, I think, but make it go very big and go in different directions and this, uh, you know, all kinds of offshoots and, and ways to sort of Easter egg stories and discover different things within the big video. Um, so, and ultimately, obviously, we'd love it, for it to be user generated. Now we're talking to, my background is in TV and so is my partners, so we've been lucky to reach out to a lot of great producers and content creators, but we love, uh, you know, the fundraising that we're doing on App Store will really go to making it user generated so that anybody could go on the web and just upload, you know, a bunch of little videos and you navigate through them. And that's that. Um, and I think, you know, in the structure is credibly conducive to kids' material just because it's so, so, so simple. Um, so we're really reaching out, and I think we'll do a whole separate app just for kids because some of the material, and this is definitely not kid friendly, but. <laughs> uh, yes, so this is what I need. <laughs> so we just need more content. You know, we're really looking for. Um, videos. You know, uh, we're talking to creative people and writers and directors and producers and anyone who wants to make a video, we want your video. So um, if that is you, let me know. Um, also, I, as I said, I work in television, but I have absolutely no connection to or knowledge of children's entertainment. <laughs> so if anyone <laughs> knows about that or is connected to that, I would love to connect with you because that is exactly what I need. And of course, we are fundraising the summer away. <laughs> so um, thank you. And there's my email address uh, and our Twitter and Facebook and everything was up there. So um, please reach out. And um, I would absolutely love to hear from you. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. So that was an awesome five by five yeah. within five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so if anyone wants to chat with Catherine afterwards, please feel free. So uh, wrapping things up. Yeah, so cool. Uh, you're doing an immersion. The next immersion, yeah. uh, you can describe it. Uh, yeah, so next immersion is going to be July 10th, and we're going to be deep diving into popcorn. Uh, so we'll be building some popcorn uh, uh, videos, interactive videos, using the JavaScript framework. Any requirements, like basic? Um, it, we're going to keep the numbers very small. Usually we keep the immersions to 30, but I think we're going to keep it to 20 just because it's going to be so hands-on. Um, you should know, you should have opened a text editor before. Um, some knowledge of HTML is going to be helpful. Um, bring a laptop as well. 
And our next forum is July 24th, and we have Fornicated from the Beatles. Oh, yeah. So this is a, um, <laughs> a pretty cool interactive theater project, um, and uh, so the creator of that project will be here to, to present it next, uh, next yeah. month. Should be fun. Thank you, everyone. Take care.